So welcome. My name is Scott Steckerty. I uh, I've been working on Sketchpad for over 20 years now. Um, and before that, I taught uh, public school, public high school math in Philadelphia for 18 years. And I'm delighted to uh, to be able to do this presentation today to, uh, to describe to you. Uh, some of the activity to show you some of the activities um, that Sketchpad allows you to use with your students, uh, aligned with the Common Core. I also see some familiar names among the attendees, and I'm I'm delighted to uh, to see some of uh, some of my old friends um, who are here today. So it's. One minute after starting time, um, we'll begin now. So our purpose in today's webinar is to show you I advertised four, I listed five on the title screen, geometry activities for Sketchpad beginners. These activities are all aligned with the Common Core. Um, I'll at least mention those alignments as we go through. Two of the activities will be prepared activities that require no construction whatsoever that you can use with your students directly without having to, uh, without having to do any construction. So they're really suitable for both teachers and students who are beginners at Sketchpad. The next two activities will be activities that are created completely from scratch, from a blank screen but they are simple enough constructions that they can be used very early on. They can even be used with some, uh, with some oversight from the teacher with students who have never used Sketchpad before. If we by any chance have extra time at the end, um, I have a fifth activity which is also a, a prepared activity um, using uh, three dimensions. If you have questions during the course of the webinar, please type them into your, uh, your question panel. I'm assisted today by Doug Klawevich and Michelle Harper, uh, who are both also like me from McGraw-Hill Education. And they will monitor the questions. They will let me know, um, interrupting me if necessary, or at the end of each activity, we'll take a, a pause for questions and we'll answer as many of those questions as we can as part of the webinar. Any that we can't, um, we'll certainly uh, get back to you on after the webinar is over. With the number of attendees we have, it's not possible to unmute people to ask questions. Um, we have uh, approaching 100 people now, and it, it would, uh, the audio, the problems with the audio would just be unsurmountable. Okay, so we'll begin. Here's today's agenda. We're going to look at two prepared activities, which require no sketchpad construction, whatever. We're going to look at two activities for student construction. And I'm also going to list quite a few of the resources and support um, structures that are available for you both to learn to use sketchpad effectively and curriculum materials that are available for you to use directly with your students. The activities we're going to look at today are first an activity called quadrilateral pretenders that addresses one of the geometry common core content standards and also addresses a number of the standards for mathematical practice. The visual demonstration of the Pythagorean theorem is Similarly, an activity that requires no construction. The first activity that does require construction will be ex exterior angles in a polygon. And the other activity that requires construction we'll look at is one on midpoint quadrilaterals, a very surprising di discovery that students can make in a very, in a very few simple steps. If we have time at the end, we'll look at an activity on pyramid dissection, a surface area activity of a pyramid. 
So those are the five activities we'll look at. Four of them we'll look at for sure, fifth one uh, if, we, if we have extra time. I want to particularly mention the standards for mathematical practice from the Common Core because these standards fit so well with so much of what students do with Sketchpad. Because Sketchpad is an open-ended tool. It's a tool that allows them to manipulate prepared sketches in any of a large number of ways. And it allows them to construct sketches from scratch. And all of these end up being activities that encourage kids to engage in abstract reasoning, to model things with mathematics, to create arguments and, and, and come up with, uh, with hypotheses and argue for their hypotheses and test their hypotheses, to come up with precise definitions of, uh, of quadrilaterals, for instance. And with that, uh, with that, we'll go on and take a look at our very first activity, which is an activity called Parallelogram Pretenders. Before we actually start manipulating these, well, no, let me start manipulating these first, and then I'll show you the worksheet that goes with it. Every one of these activities that we're going to look at today is supported with student worksheet and with a separate document of, uh, of notes and suggestions for the teacher. But let's just begin playing with this and see what happens. Because that's one of the wonderful things about Sketchpad is you don't have to know a whole lot to start playing with things. Which of these are always parallelograms? Well, what do we mean by always parallelograms? They all look like parallelograms to me. But let's see what happens if I start, oh, if I start dragging, if I click on T and start dragging it around, all of a sudden this is not a parallelogram at all. In fact, it sure looks like every one of these vertices can be dragged any way we want. <clears throat> So I could make this into any shape that I wanted. I could try to make a, uh, an isosceles trapezoid, for instance. I'm not sure if that's exactly right, but close enough. What happens if I drag another one? Well, gee, dragging in doesn't do anything at all for me. What about O? Now that vertex changes things. Does this remain a parallelogram? So maybe I need to, depending on where I am and, and at what point in my curriculum I'm using this as a student, I might need to refer to the book definition and try to make that book definition real by applying it to this particular parallel group, to this particular quadrilateral, and checking, are the opposite angles, do they seem to be equal? Do opposite sides seem to be equal? Well, it seems to be a parallelogram so far. If I drag P, it still seems to stay a parallelogram. And the same with Q. Now, different vertices result in different dragging behavior. So one of the lessons from this particular activity is going to end up being that we should check all the vertices to make sure. So coming over here to this one that looked kind of like a square, dragging C leaves it a square. Dragging F allows me to make it into a rectangle. Dragging E does nothing interesting at all. And dragging D seems to leave it a rectangle. So it seems that this one also fits the definition of a parallelogram. Opposite sides equal. Opposite angles equal. How about M? Oh, now that's an interesting one. So that gives us a different result from the others. And similarly, I can experiment with this last one. And this last one is an interesting one because if I hadn't first dragged V, in fact, let me undo several steps. I'm going to undo one of my drags. I'll do an undo of the other drag. And that just, V is selected, so that just undid the drag of V. So it appears that I have a parallelogram. And in fact, dragging X, dragging Y, dragging M, none of those 
destroys the, uh, the characteristics of a parallelogram. And it's only by dragging all four vertices that I discover that I actually have here what looks like it may be a trapezoid rather than a parallelogram. So this is an opportunity for students to test their understanding of the definition, to experiment with what, with different shapes and not just have a couple of examples in the book, but have dynamic examples of all the different shapes that you can make with a parallelogram. You can make it really narrow and thin. You can flip it from side to side. You can turn it into a square. You can turn it into a rectangle. And by experience, um, create their own image of what a parallelogram is that encompasses a lot more parallelogram shapes than just a few examples from a printed book. So let me skip to the worksheet and just show you what the worksheet looks like. So there's a beginning introduction for students. This is the worksheet that you would pass out to students before they begin actually experimenting. And the worksheet begins with the instructions to open the sketch. And it actually says right here in the first step that only two of these were constructed to always have opposite sides parallel. So the, our job is to figure out which of those is which. And I, I think we saw as we worked through that one of them was a parallelogram, one was a trapezoid, one was a kite, a rectangle and a, quadru and a general quadrilateral. The rectangle and the parallelogram were the two that always stayed parallelograms. And students will end up drawing lines connecting the various quadrilaterals with their characteristics. So then this continues asking students to go to different pages and the different pages of this sketch and the different questions in this, uh, in this worksheet ask them to explore different categories of, of quadrilaterals and eventually come to another page that I'm going to show you right now, the trapezoids page. And on this page, they're presented with a number of shapes. Oh, OK, the rhombus page. We're, no, I'm going to skip the rhombus page. The trapezoid page. We're presented with a number of, of different shapes. Uh, I need to uh, I need to apologize about this one. This one is not working quite right, and it's all right. I'll have to resolve that one later, and it's not the only one. Um, this is a this is a new a, a new version of this sketch, and. I apologize. I'm embarrassed. I will. Uh, I will see to it that this is uh, that this is fixed. Or maybe I maybe I ended up uh, pulling a an incorrect sketch out of the uh, out of some older files. Um, what students do with this? The actual way the activity is going to work is that they will. They will take this one, which can be pretend to be a trapezoid, but isn't necessarily. They can take this one, which is always a trapezoid, and a right trapezoid is always a trapezoid, and an isosceles trapezoid is always a trapezoid. Now we get into an interesting question. Is a square a trapezoid? And this comes up against the definition of a trapezoid, which is a very interesting question because in most of the world, a square is considered to be a trapezoid. In the United States, we say it must have only one pair of parallel sides. It cannot have two pairs of parallel sides. So the classification of a square, a rectangle, 
And a parallelogram in this particular activity turns out to be a very interesting question for students and one that leads to a very interesting discussion of the nature of mathematical definitions. Finally, this activity ends with a, uh, an open-ended task for students. Pick some type of quadrilateral and make it. And this requires some construction capabilities. If students already know how to do some constructions, this is appropriate. If they're not yet familiar with construction, some students may, uh, may undertake to, um, to teach themselves using some of, the, uh, some of the tools in the toolbox and some of the menus. Um, most, most will not. This, this part of the activity is actually an, what we call an Explore More section, which allows you, if you've finished early and if, you, uh, if you're interested in a particularly challenging activity, to jump ahead and look at this Explore More as, a, uh, as, a, um, as an extension, as an enrichment activity. So that's the, tr that's the uh, quadrilateral pretenders activity. And I want to ask uh, Doug and or Michelle to tell me if there are any questions that I should be answering at this point. Um, so it looks like uh, we've got a question. Uh, someone's asking, Park is using this definition. A trapezoid is a quadrilateral with at least one pair of par parallel sides. I don't know if that's more of a statement than a question, but if there's anything you want to address there, Scott. The well, the only thing I want to say is that that's a that's a really interesting question because there are two styles of uh, of definitions for quadrilaterals. One style is to say that is to partition quadrilaterals in a way that says that a parallelogram is not a trapezoid because it has two pairs of parallel sides and a trapezoid only has one. And that definition sets up a partition and sets trapezoids apart from parallelograms. But we don't do the same thing when we're comparing, for instance, parallelograms and rectangles because we say that a rectangle is a parallelogram. We don't say a parallelogram isn't a rectangle because it doesn't have right angles. We say that a rectangle is a parallelogram. It's not separated. It's not partitioned off from the set of parallelograms. But we partition off trapezoids from other parallelograms, even though a more inclusive definition would say, well, sure, a parallelogram's got one pair of parallel sides. In fact, it has two. So it's a trapezoid with an extra set, with the, um, the non-base sides also being parallel. So it's an interesting uh, approach to defining things. And we, the typical set of definitions used in, uh, in the United States is one that partitions trapezoids but does not, but uses inclusive definitions for parallelograms, rectangles, and squares. So it's just sort of an interesting question. Absolutely, and um, actually it looks like Shelly uh, is the one that sent that in, and uh, she, she also said that it's a great uh, conversation or discussion to have with students. So um, thanks for that suggestion. It's a really good one. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really important discussion in part because it shows up some of the inconsistency that goes into mathematical conventions sometimes and helps students to understand that, this is, that mathematics is something that's actually created by people and that there are different decisions that could have been made at various points in, uh, in some of what we do. And we, want, we strive for mathematical consistency, but, this is, but mathematics is actually something that they can do mathematics as students. There's nothing, there's nothing sacred or handed down about it. So let's go on to a second activity, which is also a prepared activity. And I didn't, even, uh, I didn't even show the directions here, but this activity is a, 
um, is a demonstration of the, para of the Pythagorean theorem. And you can see that, uh, that I can actually change the size of my, uh, of my triangle, and I can orient it any way I want. You know, one of the nice things about Sketchpad, by the way, is that not all triangles have horizontal and vertical uh, sides to them. Uh, so a right triangle may be at any angle we, we decide to put it at. And this particular activity is based on students learning that she the shearing transformation doesn't change the area of a, uh, of a figure. And this should be preceded by students actually experimenting with this kind of activity um, with Sketchpad, ideally, with an activity in which you have a parallelogram. And I'm just going to, uh, going to very quickly um, show the uh, So if I construct a parallel line there, I can get let me uh, okay, so let me let me put a let me make a parallelogram here. By cons and this is this is something the students should have done separately, perhaps ahead of time, uh, perhaps in another lesson. Um, but I would want them, I would want students to have actually constructed a parallelogram and measured its area. And then experiment with what happens if you change it from a rectangle just by dragging parallel to one of the uh, to the other side and see that the area doesn't change at all. So that's the basis for the fact that the area of this square is not changing even when we make it into a rhombus. So that's the fundamental mathematical principle behind understanding this demonstration. And it's much easier if we want to actually see that we're not getting any changes in the area. Um, I probably should have just measured that and kept an eye on it. So we can shear in any way we want. But we, what we have right here is the, is the square on side A, the square on side B, and a square on side C. And if we'll look at the shearing operation, we can actually shear this one down to put point A on this line. We can shear this one, again, shearing in the same direction as this, as this base that's part of the, tri the original triangle itself. And those happen to meet right there. And if I then divide the square on the hypotenuse into two rectangles and shear each of them, we get to see that we have just made a shape here that matches the shape here, a shape here that matches the shape here, so the area of these two parallelograms must be equal to the area of these two parallelograms, which means that the area of this square must be equal to the area of that square. That magic I just did, by the way, to get back to the original was just the keyboard shortcut for undo, but I used the shift key with it, which is undo all. So I just used a keyboard shortcut there to jump back to the very beginning. Undo all.
Okay, so that's the second example of an activity in which there's no construction required. Um, some preparation in terms of uh, in terms of how you how you approach the fact that you can shear one of these uh, one of these squares without changing its area. But that's the only uh, that's the only preparation that's needed, and it's mathematical preparation, not so much sketchpad preparation, because all you need to do is drag points A, B, and C in this activity. Okay, Doug and or Michelle. Um, Oh, I see Michelle already has a couple, has one question for me that came up. Can you do this with Sketchpad Explorer? You absolutely can do this with Sketchpad Explorer. The sketch works perfectly with, with Explorer because you only need to touch point A with your finger and shear it. Same touch on B and same on C. And in fact, everything about the worksheet for this one will also work well with Sketchpad Explorer. How do these, con well, really the only question for students is, how do these congruent shapes, when you're done, demonstrate the Pythagorean theorem? Okay, I see one other question. Oh, two questions. One is this, uh, is this Sketchpad 5? Yes, I'm doing everything here with Sketchpad 5. Uh, Sketchpad 5 has been out for more than uh, more than four years now, so um, the latest the latest sketches and the latest activities that we've produced over the last few years and that we've where we've adapted earlier activities to take advantage of new capabilities are all based on Sketchpad five. Uh, will the worksheet be shared afterwards? Absolutely. Um, all of these worksheets actually are available in Sketchpad directly from the help menu. This is one of the things I was going to show you at the end, but no reason not to show you now. Um, if you in the help menu go to teaching with Sketchpad, and I'm going to have to get my uh, get my browser up here, um, you will find some sample activities. You'll go into those sample activities. You'll click the geometry sample activities, and you'll see the quadrilateral pretenders that we just looked at. You'll see the visual demonstration of the Pythagorean theorem that we just looked at. And what we're going to do now, actually, is to go on to the activity around exterior angles in a polygon. Any other questions that I should be answering before I do that? Um, just looking over them, I think you covered um, most of them. One, one quick question a couple people are asking is, how long does it typically take uh, for an average student to master the construction utility of Sketchpad? It actually, so there are some complexities to the answer in this respect. Um, the, the first answer is not very long. Many teachers like to begin and with just giving students a chance to take a new sketch and experiment with some of the tools. So they can see that the point tool makes points and the compass tool makes a circle and I can click and drag or I can click and then click again. Uh, doesn't matter how you use it, it's flexible in how it works. Uh, experiment with the segment tool, which like the circle tool, I can click and then click, or I can click and drag. I can connect objects, and they just play with those tools for a little bit and get and get a bit comfortable with them. Uh, polygon tool, text tool, marker tool, and so forth. So some teachers like to have them ex have them play with the uh, play with Sketchpad, um, just develop a little bit of uh, of an understanding of how the tools work. Other teachers like to take a relatively simple activity, um, and in the ones that we were just looking at, uh, for instance, um, well, actually, let's just go ahead with the uh, with the very next activity because some this is what some teachers really prefer to do is to give students an actual activity uh, to start their learning with. 
And we're going to do that with exterior angles in a polygon right now. So this is a perfect example. Now, oops. So I've just copied here into this page. Normally students would start with an empty page. All I've done is to copy into that page the very first the very first few directions here, one, two, three, and four, I've just copied from the worksheet into the page. With actual students in a classroom, I would just distribute the worksheet. We wouldn't have this on the page. But this is to show to show you so we don't have to jump back and forth during the webinar. Uh, how easy it is to begin using Sketchpad for a very meaningful uh, geometric activity. So it says to begin by using the Ray tool. So I want first to have shown students how to find the Ray tool. The Ray tool is part of the Straight Edge tool. If you click and hold the Segment tool, you see three tools pop out, the Segment tool, the Ray tool, and the Line tool. If you don't cl click and hold, then you just get whichever tool is currently showing. So if I click and hold, I can switch back to the segment tool and now draw segments. If I just click again and let go, I'm still on segments. But if I click and hold, then I can choose a different tool. So use the Ray tool to construct a polygon with each side extended in one direction. So that's the nice thing about the ray tool for this, because I can click and click, and I have a ray. Now, I want a polygon. So this is the extension of one side. So one side of the polygon is going to go from here to here, the two points where I clicked to make my ray. So I'll start at this point and make another ray. And wherever I click, we'll drop another point right here in this case that signals the end of this side. So I'll start my third side from there, start my fourth side from here, and start my fifth side from here. And I have to be careful because if I click now, I haven't gone all the way back to my starting point, so I won't actually be connected to it. So you may have even noticed it, it snap as I got close. Sketchpad anticipates that I want to connect those. It makes it easy for me to connect them. And that click gives me a pentagon with just five points. And it actually says here in the directions, your initial sketch should have the same number of points as sides. If it, and if also, if it didn't end up convex, drag a vertex to make it convex. So we can go back and drag any of these. So now I have a pentagon that's concave and not convex. But we want it to be convex. OK. Now we're going to use the text tool to label the sides of the uh, label the vertices of the polygon. And I just want to make sure of one thing very quickly that I may have forgotten to do earlier. Um, that, that, that is a, I'm just, I just did, needed to do that to avoid confusion because I realized what I might have done earlier in this sketch. Students starting with a new sketch, what I just did is completely irrelevant for the activity. So use the text tool to label the vertices. So there's vertex A, vertex B, C, D, and E. Create an angle marker in each external angle by dragging the marker tool counterclockwise from one side to the other. So I'll take the angle marker and I'll drag counterclockwise, counterclockwise in each angle. in each exterior angle. And now I can, from the Edit menu, 
Oh, select all the angle markers. I'm going to do the easy way of selecting all the angle markers. From the Edit menu, I can choose Select All Markers, and it selects them all. I also could have done it by clicking on each one with the arrow tool. But since the Marker tool was the active tool, this Select All command becomes Select All Markers, which is very convenient. So now I can go ahead and I can measure these angles. So I have angle measurements now for all of my angles, and I can use Sketchpad's calculator to add them all up. But I'm not going to do that because there's something very, very interesting about this particular problem, which allows us to use transformations to see something that we would not have been able to see otherwise. And in fact, let me just uh, show the step here from the worksheet. So later on, by the time students get down to step eight, they're told to select everything in the sketch except the measurements and change to the dilate arrow tool. So let's select everything, and the dilate arrow tool, well this is the arrow tool, clicking and holding does the same thing here that it did for the straight edge tool. It lets us choose a different tool. So I'll choose the dilate arrow tool, and now I'm going to start dilating, and notice wherever I draw, no matter how I drag, Everything is being dilated toward and away from point E. And it doesn't matter which object I'm dragging on, everything still gets dilated toward point E. So let me keep dragging closer and closer to point E. And you know what I'm going to do first before we go any farther is I'm going to hide the labels of all the objects just to make it easier to see what's going on as we dilate so the labels don't get in the way. And notice what's happening with those angle markers. Now, one of the things students will notice as they drag, or you should call students' attention to, is that the angles don't actually change when you dilate. That's an important property of dilation. But as we get closer and closer to the center, we see what happens to those angle markers. And all of a sudden, we have a different way of looking at the fact that the exterior angles all add up to 360 degrees. So that's a very nice feature of, of that's a very nice outcome of looking at it in this way and being able to dilate um, that polygon down to essentially a point. So nothing too complicated here. We had to choose the ray tool. We had to click it a few times. We had to make sure that we closed up by coming back to our beginning point. We did use the measure menu to measure some angles. We used the marker tool to actually mark the angles, and then we use the dilation tool to pull it all together. So this is not, um, there's not too much that's complicated here. I would say that this is a nice activity for students, uh, perhaps even their second or third experience with Sketchpad. One of the challenges for us as teachers is that students are always quicker to pick these things up than we are ourselves. Okay, let me pause again for, uh, for questions. Um, do we have any, any new questions that have come in that I, should, uh, that I should be aware of? No questions right now? Oh, sorry. I'm yep. I'm here. Uh, we got one from Ricky um, that you may want to take a look at. This is um, 
says your Pythagorean example seems to have one solution. I like problems where students can come up with and compare different solutions that can lead to mathematical discussions. More like your first example, do you see this difference between the two, or am I missing something? So he wanted, I, I guess they were trying to go back to that previous example. Well, the Pythagorean example is is one of many um, of many ways of using Sketchpad to look at the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it's a particularly interesting way because it's so visual in nature. Um, I think by one example, Ricky, you're probably you're probably thinking of uh, of some of the many different ways that can be used to demonstrate the Pythagorean theorem. And in fact, um, there's there's a whole activity book of Sketchpad activities called Pythagoras Plugged In of just all different ways of using Sketchpad to explore the Pythagorean theorem. So there are lots and lots of different ways. Um, a number of them, a number of the standard ways of, uh, of addressing the Pythagorean theorem in Sketchpad involve students doing various constructions. Um, so there, there are lots of different ways. That particular one is a prepared sketch, so it, it really shows only one way. But, uh, you know, I certainly am, um, you know, the fact that you can explore just about any way of demonstrating the Pythagorean theorem you can do in Sketchpad, for sure. Okay. Um, support for... You know, support for hey, uh, for a variety of ways. Oh, go ahead. Uh, just one other quick question. Uh, Maureen had a, a question about this current example. Uh, she says, suppose you measure the five exterior angles and then dilate to see that sum stays at 360 degrees. Sure, we can certainly do that. Um, what's What we may want to do in addition as we do that um, let's just let's just see how easy that is to do. From the number menu, I'll choose calculate, and I should have restarted Sketchpad because I have two screens here, and I, I'm it's not easy for me right now to get the Sketchpad's. Oh no, here it is. Never mind. Let me get the Sketchpad's calculator back from my other screen. Um, so to calculate, we only need to click on these objects, press the plus sign on my keyboard, click the next measurement, plus sign, click the next measurement, so forth. And so I can add them all up very easily. One of the questions that comes up sometimes when you do this kind of thing, by the way, is students may say, well, this can't be right because seven-tenths and four-tenths, the last digit is going to be one, and five is six, and four is ten, and one more, it should be 360.1, shouldn't it? And one, one, always has to, uh, one always has to watch out, you know, if these are rounded off to whole, to whole numbers, this might come out, this will always be 360, but these numbers rounded off might not quite work out because of rounding errors. And one of the nice things about this, about Sketchpad, is it's very easy to look at the properties of each of these and say, well, what if we looked at this in hundred thousands? And what if we looked at this one in hundred thousands? And then we can, this way we can see how it's actually an optical illusion, not an optical illusion, but something of the sort. Um, it's, it's only due to rounding errors that we ended up with what looked like on the face of it, if you just added, you know, if these had been exactly to tenths, what looked like an error, and in fact it's not an error at all. And sure enough, that sum to hundred thousands is exactly that. 
Okay, that was a digression. I apologize for the digression. But besides seeing that they're all the same under dilation, in fact, we can move any of these vertices anywhere we want, and we still see that even as some of the angles are changing and some of them aren't, depending on which vertex I'm dragging, all of these are changing, but this is rock solid. So that's a nice question. Okay. This activity is actually supported by a presentation sketch that you can use if you're presenting it to, uh, to students. Um, so this is a prepared sketch that you can use as a whole class presentation, and it actually, uh, it actually has several different, uh, several different pages to it. Okay, the last of the, uh, of the activities we create from scratch is midpoint quadrilaterals. Having done the last one, we'll find that this one is even a little bit easier in terms of the construction. We're going to begin by constructing quadrilateral A, B, C, D. And I'll show you a new tool for this one, the polygon tool. And I, I don't want the filled polygon, but just the segments around the outside. So quadrilateral A, B, C, D. I'll click, 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 and back to my original point A. That by clicking again on the original point A, that completes the polygon. There we have it. There's our polygon A, B, C, D. We can use the arrow tool to make this into any shape polygon we want. Construct the midpoints of the sides is our second step. So construct is, uh, is a tip-off here in this case, because we have no midpoint over here in the toolbox. To look at the construct menu, we're going to be able to construct the midpoint, but we must first select the side to do it. So that constructs one midpoint. Now, interestingly, we can construct the remaining three midpoints all at once, if we like, by just selecting all three sides by clicking on them and constructing those three midpoints as well. Now connect those midpoints to construct another quadrilateral. So here we go. Connect the midpoints. E to F to G to H. Back to E to finish. So there's our quadrilateral in the middle. And Drag the vertices around and observe that midpoint quadrilateral. So there's something very interesting about that midpoint quadrilateral. And so I can drag more freely without worrying about, uh, about distinguishing one from another. Let me just color these. Uh, let's change those, uh, say, to, uh, to a nice bright red. And notice that I can do all kinds of interesting things here, but there's something that stays the same about this midpoint quadrilateral. So let me jump back to the worksheet. And the worksheet asks students to measure the slopes of the four sides. And The purpose of measuring the slopes of the four sides and the four side lengths is to determine that it's not just our eyes fooling us, but for instance, if we measure those four lengths, we see absolutely that EF and GH are the same length, HE and FG are the same um, are the same length, and those lengths remain matched no matter what I do. If we measured these angles, we would find that opposite angles are equal, and adjacent angles add up to 180. So we'd find that we have all the characteristics here of a parallelogram, and the rest of the activity 
is simply manipulating and exploring a bit more with some additional constructions to explore why it is, how we can reason about this, and how we can explain, what explanation can we come up with for why this quadrilateral formed from the midpoints of any quadrilateral in any shape, even across quadrilateral. Why is this connecting midpoints quadrilateral always a parallelogram. So it's a really nice activity to discover an unusual fact and then reason about it and do some exploration and try to come up with a way to explain it. So that's the fourth of my activities. And I'd like to pause once more for questions and then, uh, and then show you some, uh, some some of the resources that we have available. Um, I will I will take this opportunity to to just just real quick swing by this this activity, which has a three dimensional rendering of a um, of a pyramid, and gives students the capability of changing the size of the base, changing the height of the sides and even changing the number of uh, the number of sides to the base and exploring how would we go about measuring the surface area of this uh, of this pyramid and relate that to the pyramid net that we have over here on the side so that's one more of the activities that are available um, from the help menu, help teaching with Sketchpad. Remember I showed you those sample activities that we got to there. Here are five more sample activities in that geometry section. I'm going to leave the resources available here um, while, I, while I answer further questions. Um, the Learning Center and the Reference Center are both available from the help menu. Um, Sketchpad itself can be seen here and it can be ordered directly from the MHE online site. We have a bunch of resources available in the form of printed activity modules. We have a number of online courses to learn to use Sketchpad effectively for high school teachers, geometry, algebra, advanced mathematics. Uh, there's a middle school. Uh, there's a course specifically for middle school teachers, and there's a course specifically for elementary teachers. Sketch Exchange at this URL is a great vehicle for asking questions, for seeing what sketches other people have done, for uploading your own sketches. Our blog at Sign of the Times is very interesting, and finally, um, our newest activities come from an NSF project called Dynamic Number, and I've listed that as well. So those are, those are the resources that we make available to you. Um, so other questions? Nothing yet. Uh, I think we answered most of the questions um, that I'm seeing. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, if you did if you did submit a question and we didn't happen to get to it today, um, we will we'll follow up with you directly so you'll you'll be able to get a response from us. Um, so yeah, if there's uh, any other questions, go ahead and uh, uh, put them in the question. Someone just asked if uh, they'll be able to watch the presentation. Yes, you guys will all receive a follow up email from uh, from McGraw Hill Education uh, with the link to the recording and. We'll include some links to some of the resources we discussed here as well so that you guys will have those all in one place. Um, and we do have a, a quick exit survey um, uh, that will pop open as you leave. So we would really um, appreciate uh, your time just answering a couple questions about the presentation. Um, but yeah, if you have Doug, any other questions, uh, feel free to ask. Doug, I have, I have one question for you, mm -hmm. which is if anyone, if anyone um, is interested in having this presentation sketch that I used here in the in the webinar itself if anyone is interested in having that um, do we have a mechanism for making that available to people or should I post it on sketch exchange 
Um, absolutely, we will we will provide the, uh, the the sketchpad file from the what what uh, Scott used to say as well in the follow up email. So yeah, thank Terrific. you, Scott, for reminding me. That's a great point. Terrific. So if uh, if there's no other questions, um, thank you everybody for for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your time, and and Scott, thank you for for your time and uh, and showing us uh, all the great activities on Sketchpad. Well, you're very welcome. I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming.